so far. Okay, I'm ready to go. Then um, I would say uh, we just start. So hello everybody. My name is Rainer Blair. I'm manager of the BioCryo facility. And today I'm trying to give you an impression of what we are doing for Cryo SEM in our core. So let's go right into it. So the, the whole workflow is a logical sequence of about seven steps. So first we have to mount our sample into special uh, sample carriers. Those carriers um, need to fit in our sample holder. Once that is done, we form a sandwich that contains the sample. This sample is then frozen either by high pressure freezing or liquid ethane. We then load the sample into a into our sample holder. That happens in a loading dock. Once the sample is mounted. Um, once the sample is mounted, we take it up with our cryo shuttle. The cryo shuttle is then used to transfer the frozen sample into the ACE 600. And that's the instrument where we do um, the next three steps, freeze fracture, freeze etching, and cryo coating. And when this is done, again, the sample is taken up by our cryo shuttle and transferred into the SEM for observation at low temperature. So in the next slides, I will tell you about more details about each of these uh, steps. So the sample mounting in the sample carriers uh, looks like this. So the carriers are pretty small. They are three millimeter in outer diameter and they can come in different variations. They are made of copper or aluminum and they can have a recess on each side. For example, 100 micrometers on one side and 200 micrometers on the other side or just uh, 300 micrometers on one side and a flat uh, end on the other side. What we have to do is we have to form a sandwich with two of those carriers and we can combine them in different ways to create uh, different sized uh, volumes inside that will contain the sample. For mounting, for filling the carriers with the sample, that's an easy step if we have, for example, liquid samples like a cell culture. We would just pipette a small amount into each carrier, put the sandwich together, and then depending on what format we chose, we can have different size volumes that contain our samples inside of the carrier. And for non-liquid samples, the situation is a bit different. For this case, we can, for example, use our VT1200S. It's a vibrating blade uh, microtome. And with this, we can section wet samples like tissues or hydrogels. Um, we can make sections with a very precise thickness about you know, 100 micrometers or 200 micrometers, whatever volume we have chosen. And we can then use a punch out tool to create disks that fit exactly into our carriers. Of course, we have some other possibilities for carriers too. But whenever possible, we should use uh, our, our flat carrier system with a three millimeter diameter because um, that works the most uh, reliably in my experience. So once the sample is mounted, we have to freeze it. We have two basic ways of freezing a sample. One is with high pressure freezing, which is shown here. So the sample sandwich is formed again with the two carriers. The carriers are put in the in a mid plate and the cartridge system is assembled. And this system is then frozen with a high pressure freezer. So a short sequence is shown here. Sandwich is formed, it's transferred into the mid plate. Cartridge system is aligned and with this, uh, the sample is frozen. Uh, the sample is then dropped into liquid nitrogen and it stays frozen until the end of the procedure, until we have basically obtained our data in the cryo SEM. The second way we can use to freeze the sample is to use uh, liquid ethane. So we use a, a large bath that contains liquid nitrogen and this is used to cool down a metal cup in the center. And when we 
pour gas, uh, ethane gas into this cup, it's so cold, the gas liquefies and we can drop our sample sandwich into this uh, ethane, liquid ethane. With both methods, we, the result is um, a sandwich, a frozen sandwich of two carriers that contains the sample in the inside. So the next step then is loading the sample. This happens in a loading station. This loading station is filled with liquid nitrogen. And when we look from top into this uh, station, we can see here this copper part, that is our sample holder. And we can see one of those sandwiches mounted here. There's another space free, so in, we can mount uh, two of those sandwiches into this sample holder. And this happens, of course, under liquid nitrogen. And here on the right, we see a, a sample holder with two of those carrier sandwiches mounted. So the bottom carrier is pinched by the sample holder, so it's kept in place, and it also has good contact to provide good thermal uh, conduction. And as I have mentioned before, we have some other patterns for sample holders, so we can use aluminum stubs with the sample on top, or we can have uh, you know, one with two clamps, for example, for, for cover slips. But still, uh, with this system here at the bottom, with the three millimeter carriers, we have um, best contact to the sample holder, and this gives you the most uh, stable samples. So here's an overview of the next step. So we are in the loading station. We have mounted our carrier sandwiches. We take them up into our cryo shuttle here. So this shuttle is also cooled with liquid nitrogen. And this shuttle is then transferred over to the ACE 600. And in this ACE 600, we have a, a cryo stage here. We have a, a cure on the side that cools down the cryo stage. And also we have a, a touch screen, of course, for operation. So what happens inside the ACE 600? So first we do a freeze fracture. That means we physically break our samples in two by popping off the upper carrier. And this means, so what we, we are looking now in the exposed interior of a sample at the fractured surface. And you can see here that um, many things can happen. So we have no real influence on the plane where the fracture is going through. It can be go around whole cells or organelles. It can go through the hydrophobic region of a bilayer membrane. The whole organelle or structure can break out with, without any membrane, with part of the membrane. Or we can have a cross fractures uh, through an organelle or through a feature in our sample. And the next step is optional. That means that's called, uh, no, so, I want to just to emphasize again how it should look here on top. You can see the carrier here. That's how we go into the ACE with the sandwich mounted. And here you can see the situation after the top carrier is, is kicked off the sample. So the next step then is optional. That's the freeze etching. Freeze etching means we are increasing the temperature of our prior stage. And this means that uh, we sublimate the superficial ice layer from the surface of our sample. And this results then in a more relief uh, view, three-dimensional view of, of features that are close to the surface of the sample. I will tell about freeze etching more in the next slide. After freeze etching, in any case, we have to coat our sample. And that means we are coating the sample with a layer of platinum followed by a layer of carbon. So this is required. The platinum gives us um, a lot of secondary electrons for imaging the surface of the sample. And the carbon layer provides an additional layer of conductivity to the sample. So here is some, uh, some details about the etching procedure. So, the ACE 600 has a vacuum in the specimen chamber. It's in the 10 to the minus seven millibar range. And from the sublimation curve, we can see um, 
from temperatures going starting at minus 115 degrees Celsius and higher, we are on the sublimation side of this uh, vapor pressure curve. And that means um, this is from this temperature on, we get um, removal of the superficial ice on, on our sample. The table on the right shows us that, excuse me, shows us that the range from minus 110 to minus 90 degrees Celsius is the most uh, effective range for etching because in this temperature range, we have a reasonable uh, etching rates, which means removal of nanometers of ice per second. For example, at minus 100 degrees for one minute, we have removed about 120 nanometers of ice from the surface. Of course, um, these values are theoretical, they are calculated, and but they give us a good and a good idea how to start with a given sample. And from these parameters, it's also clear that it's um, essential to have a good control of the temperature of our cryo stage to, to achieve um, reproducible results. So here we see the ACE 600 sitting on the bench. The cryo shuttle is attached to it. So the cryo stage is in here. We have a dewer. The dewer is cooling the cryo stage and it's cooling a, a plate. And this plate is attached to a lever that we can uh, manipulate from the outside. And it's this lever that we use to, to fracture the sample, to pop off the, the upper carrier of the sandwich. The loading dock, by the way, is sitting here on the side. And the, um, the operation of the ACE is done with a touch screen, you can see here. And on the right, we can see, for example, the etching menu in the screen. We can also see we are in the 7.2 7 times 10 to the minus 7 millibar with the vacuum. Temperature is at minus 153 degrees. And for etching, we can now adjust the temperature where we want to go to here minus 105 degrees, how long we want to stay at that temperature before the temperature is dropping down to our starting temperature again. And we can also um, adjust the, the rate of, of temperature increase, which means um, degrees Celsius per minute. So the lower screen here, sorry again, the lower screen here shows um, the coating menu. So we are, here we have the platinum source chosen. And what we can adjust here is the tilting angle of the stage, the stage that uh, contains our sample holder, and also, of course, um, the thickness uh, that we want to apply to the sample. Okay. So here's that whole process shown again in overview. So we've mount and freeze the sample. We go. And usually we are not doing everything in one day. After the sample is frozen, we store it in liquid nitrogen and we can store it for days or weeks or even months. And then when the day for the cryo SEM experiment comes, then we follow up with the sequence with mounting the sample in the loading station using the shuttle for transfer to the ACE and then transferring the sample from the ACE into the cryo SEM. So the following slides are showing you some example of this whole procedure. So this here is uh, on the left, we see a sample that was, both samples were high pressure frozen, fractured, etched and coated. So the left is, uh, is these two yeast cells, so Saccharomyces cerevisiae and the fracture plane on this cell here on the left was going through the cytoplasm and uh, across the nucleus. We can very nicely see the nuclear pores here. We can also see some uh, organelles are breaking out, some organelles were staying in the sample. So it's really a mixture of different fracture planes that we can observe. So this cell on the right here shows us the ridges of the ridges of the yeast membrane, which are visible once the, the outer cell wall is uh, removed. That was done by by the fracture. The right example here is a 
epithelium cell of a freshwater clam. And again, we can very nicely see the nucleus with nuclear pores and also several cell organelles um, in the cytoplasm. Another exam, biological example is here a mouse kidney tissue cell was also high pressure frozen, freeze fractured, but here we did a more intense etching. And then again, coating and observation of the frozen sample in the cryo SEM. So here we can see a lot of organelles, vesicles, droplets, and membrane features. Um, in this sample, and if, when we follow those yellow arrows, we can really see that uh, membranes are forming stacks in the cytoplasm and also large leaflets. So we are really getting a three-dimensional uh, expression of the sample as compared to the two-dimensional images that we can obtain with TEM. So on the right side, again, we can see membranes of an organelle. I think that's a Dolce apparatus. We can see vesicles that are forming. And we can also see some mitochondria. When we look in more detail at mitochondria, we can very nicely see that the matrix is filled with those cristae formed by the membranes. And again, this sample was etched for a bit longer than usual to, to achieve this more relief uh, effect. So the next sample here again is a, this is a human colon cancer cell. And on the left, we see a fracture plane that was going across the whole cell. So we are looking on the outside of the cell membrane. We also have, sorry, some areas where the fracture went right through the whole cytoplasm, through the whole cell. On the right side here, we can see a lot of mucus containing vesicles that, uh, that that store the mucus that is uh, excreted by these cells. So this here is cytoplasm inside. We can see the profile of some microvilli and this here is the extracellular space. So again, that was high pressure frozen, free structured, just slightly etched, coated, and then observed in cryoacea. So another published example here is the animal formation of tooth dentin. So we were especially interested in this matrix region between the ameloblasts Oh no. My system here is freezing up at the moment. Let's give us a short time. But I can still describe what we see. So with MA is the matrix region we are interested in. Okay, here we go. And when we look in detail at this sample, we can see on the right side that the newly formed animal crystals are coated with an organic matrix. And this matrix is forming ring-like structures and consists of spherical subunits. Sorry again. And when we look at the face of the crystals that is, um, that is facing the ameloplast, we see exactly the same structures. This is the last, the lower two rows. We, again, we can see this uh, coating of an organ with an organic matrix. We can see those ring-like structures. And the bottom two images um, were processed to, to show these um, ring-like structures that are formed by this matrix in more detail. So in this study, cryo SEM was required to deliver further evidence that was provided by other methods, but cryo SEM helped really to get this uh, paper published by adding this uh, additional information. So the next slide here shows again uh, another published study. Here the theme was um, erythropoiesis, that means the, the generation or the development of red blood cells. As we all know, red blood cells do not contain a nucleus, but the whole process starts with um, erythroblasts that still are nucleating cells. And with light microscopy, it could be, it was shown that there must be, during this uh, process, there must be an opening in nuclear envelopes through which nuclear material is expelled. 
so that the nucleus becomes smaller until it's small enough that the whole nucleus can be expelled. And this results then in an enucleated cell, which is the red blood cell. And cryo-SEM was used to, to show these features, to visualize these features, and indeed. So we could really show that there are unusual openings uh, in these cells during this process. On the right side, you see a, a scheme about the process. We are starting with the whole cell, with the nucleus, which resembles this image here. And then an opening is forming in the nuclear envelope. Material is expelled. That is what we are seeing here. And this process is repeated until the nucleus is small enough so that we finally have an enucleated cell. And this uh, image even made it to the cover of this issue of development of cell. So the next is uh, just an experimental sample. So here we are looking at liposomes. Those also were high pressure frozen, fractured, etched, and coated. And we can really nicely see um, the single spheres that, that are those liposomes. And in some cases, the fracture plane was even going through the liposomes or liposomes so that we can uh, look at the inside. So the next uh, two images, those are actually um, user samples made, processed, and images taken by users, former users of the Scott lab or the Stub group, Drs. Carabine and Dr. Jones. So, and here we can see different types of hydrogels. For example, the one on the left seems to be composed of uh, more fiber-like material, while the one on the right, sorry, one on the right seems to be composed of more band-like uh, features. And another sample from hydrogel that hydrogel that was published. Um, this was a material that was constructed to simulate a real tissue, for example, for usage as a skin on robotic devices. And cryo SEM was the only method that could show the interaction of this uh, hydrogel, the matrix with those, those grains embedded in this gel. And the interface was very well visible on fractured samples. And it was clear that um, the matrix has contacts on all sides to those grains. And again, uh, in this case, also cryo -SEM was the only method that was able to demonstrate that. So I want to show you one last example. This is a different sample from the material science world. This is a, was a, po is a polished niobium surface, and that was cooled down in the SEM to minus 136 degrees. And during this cooling down, there was, we could observe the formation of niobium hydrates. This is that material that's bulging out of this uh, polished surface. And this is just to, to give you an idea that we can use the cryo stage not just to look at frozen samples, we can also use it for cooling down samples while we observe them. If they can, if the samples can stand the vacuum in the electron microscope, of course. So with this sample, I want to conclude this. I uh, know one more thing about yeah how we organize um, the cryo SEM so uh, experiments. A user has to be trained on room temperature usage of the S forty eight hundred. The S forty eight hundred obviously is the one the SEM that we use for for cryo SEM. And on the day of the cryo SEM experiment, so the bio cryo staff will, will mount the cryo stage into the SEM and start the cool down. And usually the stage in the SEM is ready at about 11.30. So it has, that means it has reached its lowest temperature, which is about minus 150 degrees Celsius. The user can then use the cryo SEM, of course, including loading dock, shuttle, and AC 600 all day. The fees per run and not per hour. And in the next morning, when the stage has come back to room temperature, um, we will again remove this, uh, the cryo stage. So you don't have to bother about that. So, 
with this, I want to conclude this talk and I'm ready for your questions. Thank you.